So, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the host for organizing this event. Um, so I'm Fabien Chouteau, uh, Embedded Software Engineer at AdaCore. Uh, here you can find some of the uh, silly stuff I do. Um, and today I want to talk about alternative programming languages uh, for safe and secure risk v um, So I will first start with a bit of context. Uh, then I will uh, try to explain the philosophy of the languages of, of my choice, and then I will try to open more the, 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 the perspective with some uh, ideas on how the RISC-V community can keep the door open for alternative programming languages. Uh, so the first question is, what do I mean by alternative? Uh, well, basically, it's everything that is not C or C++. Okay. Uh, so I know that uh, FOSDEM is probably the best audience for this kind of talk, um, but uh, probably most of you are going, uh, you know, why? What is wrong with C and C++? I'm perfectly fine. I like it. It's, it's great. Uh, so we could talk about the Stockholm Syndrome, uh, but <laughs> I think I will focus on something more uh, positive uh, today. So there are a lot of different programming languages, a uh, lot of different principles, and of course they all try to give you, uh, to help you make the best uh, software the fastest uh, by uh, reducing the debugging time, reducing the maintenance cost, reduce, uh, increasing the portability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I'm sorry if your favorite language is not in the list here. Um, so first, let me let me let me say uh, that uh, there is no silver bullet. All right. Uh, if someone tells you, "Okay, use this language; it's going to be great; all your problems are solved," just run away. There's there's no such thing. But there is a lot of uh, progress and, and, and improvements to be made uh, on top of what you usually get. Why am I uh, uh, considering that? Uh, uh, let's say. These languages are alternative um, uh, because usually when you get a piece of hardware, uh, you always have a C, C++ compiler with it, which is not necessarily true for uh, all the others. Uh, so I have a uh, really clear bias towards two of them. So that's what that's the languages that I will uh, talk about today. Uh, so. Uh, as I said at the end of the presentation, I will try to open the subject a little bit more. <coughs> um, why do I think these two languages are uh, relevant to the RISC-V uh, community? So these are, uh, um, so Ada and Spark, um, um, some say system level programming languages or embedded, uh, you can say, uh, uh, bare, bare metal programming languages, so they compile to machine code like uh, like C, C++, Rust, and, and, and other. Um, and what I uh, really like about those languages is that they really make the, the great gap between, uh, on one hand, being very high level, and we, I will show you some examples, and on the other hand, uh, being really uh, close to the hardware, giving a lot of control to the to the developers. <coughs> so, yes, two there. Uh, so, some keywords about uh, Ada and Spark. Uh, so, these languages are really from the ground up designed for safety and security. Um, what's probably the most important? Uh, those two points here: powerful means of specifications. I will show you that, uh, and strong typing. What's important to note here as well is that uh, it's Ada and Spark are not only strongly typed, they also give you uh, uh, a lot of ways to define uh, your own types, which is, which is really important. And then you have all the good stuff, uh, object-oriented, uh, concurrent programming, generics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> so this is my uh, very personal way of explaining the philosophy of, of uh, Ada and Spark. Um, programming is all about communication. You have something in your head, you have an idea, and you want to express it to different 
people and different uh, tools and machines as well. Uh, so of course you talk with the compiler because that's what is going to make the code to run on the CPU. You're talking with other tools, uh, static analyzers, provers, I will, I will talk about that again. Users of your API, of course, they have to understand what you have in mind when using the API. Your team, colleagues, uh, working on maintaining the software that you wrote. And of course yourself, uh, because we all know very well that in two weeks we will never remember what this piece of code is doing. So let's start with uh, an example, simple example. Um, I'm writing a driver for this uh, servo motor. So you know this is a, a piece of hardware that you can control by the, you can set the uh, position, the angle. Um, so this is how I would write the API in uh, Ada. So in other languages, you might just use a, float, a floating point as an argument for your uh, subprogram to set the angle. Uh, but floating point is really uh, not enough information for the API because it can be uh, Radiance can be degrees, can be a percentage from 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1. There is not enough information. With ADA, you have the means to specify what you really mean. So you declare your own type with some restriction. You say, OK, it's a float, but I only allow uh, values between minus uh, 90 to plus 90. So just by doing this, you're giving a lot of information to the compiler that will decide the, the right uh, representation in the hardware for this, uh, for this type, to the uh, checkers that will check if the values are correct uh, within the range, to the user of the API, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, another means of uh, specification in, uh, in EDA is the, what, we call, what is called the programming by contract. So you have uh, preconditions, something that must be true when you call the subprogram, and a post condition, something that is guaranteed to be true when the subprogram returns. So very classic, basic example, you write a stack. Uh, of course, it doesn't make sense to uh, push something on the stack if the stack is full. So you express it in the API. And same thing, when you, once you have pushed something on the stack, uh, well, it's not empty anymore. So this is called programming by contract because the contract is that if you uh, give the right uh, parameters, you will get the right uh, outcome of, of the, um, the subprogram. Um, so now let's take an example that is probably more relevant to this room. Uh, so something that I don't have time to talk about, there is uh, some kind of uh, real-time operating system within the ADA uh, programming languages. Uh, uh, there's actually a, a blog post, if you go to blog.adacore.com, I have a blog post about this. Uh, so right now, I'm working on uh, porting this real-time operating system to uh, RISC-V. And so I have to work with the uh, platform local interrupt controller to handle interrupts. So this is from the, the specification. Um, very quickly, the idea is that you know, there's an interrupt uh, notification. Some piece of software here will claim the interrupt. So I want to uh, service this interrupt. The uh, PLIC will answer with an interrupt uh, ID. The software handles the interrupts, and then we uh, signal the completion of the interrupt to, uh, the, to the PLIC. <clears throat> so how do we uh, specify this in our code? So first we define our types. Uh, so this value here will be dependent on the, uh, on the, uh, on the implementation, but uh, let's say I have maximum of uh, the last interrupt ID is 15. Um, this is a common design pattern in, in, uh, in ADA. Uh, so the range should be 0 to 15, but actually I, I add one more value that give me uh, the, um, the opportunity to define something that is not an interrupt, so an invalid value if you want. And usually we have the prefix any in that case. So I define my range uh, and I define that uh, the, the, the last value of the range is, means uh, no, no interrupt. Then I define a subtype because I also want to express when uh, the interrupt ID is valid. 
And so this is a subtype of the full uh, range. OK, so let's write the uh, API. Um, to write our uh, specification, we need uh, to extend the, uh, let's say, the definition that comes from the hardware. So this is what I'm doing here. This function here, claimed, that returns the last claim interrupt, is not really uh, implemented by the hardware. It's not mapping a hardware uh, feature. But I need this, uh, this function to do my specifications later. This is why I will uh, flag it as ghost. Uh, this means that the compiler know it's only used for verification, and the function will not be in the final uh, executable. So I have this function, tells me what, what is the last uh, claimed interrupt, and potentially uh, we can see it's any, so it can be uh, no interrupt. So now what is the, uh, the contract for, the, uh, for claiming uh, an interrupt? So we can claim uh, an interrupt. It, it, can, it can be that there is no interrupt to, 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 uh, to handle, so potentially we have no interrupts here. Uh, what we want as a precondition is that um, there is no interrupt claimed uh, when we start doing this. So we cannot, uh, we cannot claim an interrupt when there's already one claim. And once we return from this function, the uh, interrupt claimed is the result of this function. Okay, and the last point to complete the, uh, the uh, interrupt. So again, I have the contract here. I can only complete a valid interrupt, so it's not any. Uh, and my precondition is that uh, there is an interrupt claimed uh, and uh, that the interrupt here that I want to complete is the one that was claimed. Okay, and the post condition is, uh, is that there's no more uh, interrupt claim. So uh, I'm asking to the expert, I'm not sure this is really uh, you know, valid representation of the, of the hardware specification. But what we can say is that at least we can talk about this. So it's, it's really, it's expressed, and uh, everybody is able to, to reason and to, and to discuss. Now, what is happening, um, how these uh, constraint uh, contracts are actually used um, um, by the tools. So there's, there's different ways. The first one is the, the runtime checks. So um, maybe you, you notice, but the, 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 the contracts are actually just the same as the code that you write uh, in Ada. Uh, and so the compiler can produce uh, code for it, which means every time you run, every time you call the complete uh, subprogram, there will be some piece of code that will check the precondition is true when you return, the postcondition is true. So uh, obviously, this will have a huge uh, performance penalty. But this is still uh, something we want to do, for instance, for debug or testing, where uh, performance is maybe not the most uh, important thing. Um, and what this means is that when I debug, I have uh, uh, right away uh, all the information about what's going wrong in my application. <coughs> and same thing for testing. You save a lot of time writing your test because you already specified uh, the boundaries of your inputs, outputs, and everything is, is, is checked. Now uh, we can do a little bit better than that. Of course, we want to, uh, at some point when we release the, the software, we want to remove uh, the runtime checks. Um, so there are multiple solutions for that. First, the compiler, um, because we uh, express a lot more uh, with, the, with the contracts and, and with the strong typing, uh, the compiler can do some basic verification. So if you do something really obvious, like uh, setting uh, the, the servo uh, angle to, uh, to an invalid value uh, statically, the compiler will find it very easy. The static analyzer, uh, so if you don't know, static analyzer is a, is a tool that will do its best to find bugs. Uh, sometimes we compare it to peer review, so the tool will analyze the code and try to find bugs. Sometimes 
it will find uh, things that are actually not bugs, and some bugs the, the, the static analyzer will not find. What's the advantage of uh, EDA in Spark in this, in this uh, situation? That because we give a lot more information, the, tools, the tool is, is really more uh, capable of, of uh, giving a good, a good uh, result. Um, and the last step, which is the, somehow the ultimate uh, goal for uh, software verification, is the formal verification. Um, so formal verification is actually doing mathematical proof that there is no, uh, there is no bug in your uh, application. So this is what we do with uh, Spark. So Spark is a subset of the ADA language. Uh, in a way, like uh, Mizrafi is a subset of C. But as I said, Spark is for uh, formal verification. So Spark uh, transforms your uh, software into a mathematical proof, and then we tell you, we'll be able to tell you if there is no bug at all. So this is uh, extremely powerful uh, because you can you can say uh, I have a, a mathematical proof that there is no buffer overflow in my application, there is no division by zero, there is no integer overflow, and for instance that I follow the API uh, listed above. So, of course, very, very strong uh, uh, guarantees that you get from this tool. On the other hand, as you probably guess, it's, uh, it's, it's more difficult to, uh, to, to achieve this level of safety uh, because you have to tell, to tell uh, really precisely how your application is supposed to work. <coughs> so, <coughs> all of this uh, is... What, what we can call functional safety. That's the, that's the ultimate goal of, of uh, Ada and Spark. Uh, to be able to say that your program does what it's supposed to do and only what it's supposed to do. Um, so this was the really high level part. Uh, how do I specify my application and how do I check that it works? As I said at the beginning, uh, Ada and Spark are also great languages for, uh, for uh, hardware access, uh, manipulating the hardware. Um, <coughs> for every type that you define in Ada, uh, you have the high-level view and you have the low-level hardware representation of the type. So here it's not necessarily very interesting, uh, but I can specify the size in the alignment. Uh, for enumerations, uh, same thing, so I can define the size, uh, define the, the values, the hardware values that are used for uh, each uh, enumeration. Um, for records, so records is uh, more or less the equivalent of struct uh, in C, but much more advanced, but let's, let's, let's say it's equivalent here. And uh, so again, high level uh, definition of my type and low level representation specification. Uh, so here I can see we, can, we can set the, the ranges of uh, uh, really which uh, bits in the, in the, uh, in the byte uh, will, will be used by each field of the, of the record. Uh, and so the ultimate goal and the ultimate benefit that you get from this uh, is that you don't have to do these kind of things anymore. Um, this is really error prone. There is no uh, checking whatsoever. Uh, and, and so... I would say, unfortunately, this is more or less the, the industry standard for dr drivers, uh, but this is really, uh, really, really, really uh, easy to, to mess up. So uh, in ADA, with all the hardware representation that we define, uh, this is what we would do. So here, um, I'm not using any pointers at all. I declare a variable, and I tell to the compiler, do not allocate this variable on the stack, do not allocate it on the heap or whatever. I'm giving you the address where this variable is allocated. Again, very important, this is not a pointer. And then I can just assign the value to the field I want to modify. Um, <clears throat> so, as you can guess, this is really, really powerful. One slight problem that we have with this is that it's, it's a bit, uh, you know, it's a bit uh, cumbersome to write all these things, especially with uh, modern microcontrollers, for instance, that have uh, uh, thousands of, of, of registers. Uh, so something nice that uh, happened in the world of uh, 
ARM microcontrollers is the definition of the SVD format. Um, so SVD is a uh, is hardware uh, description, more or less, uh, of the memory mapped registers. And we, with, uh, with the SVD to ADA tool, we can generate um, um, all the uh, hardware mapping uh, in ADA. Uh, and I will come back to this because I think this is really uh, a, uh, something, something really, really important. Um, <clears throat> another point which might be of interest, uh, ADA is really easy to interface with the C uh, application. So, uh, for instance, here I have a C function that I want to use in ADA. I can just import it. So I just import. I say it's a C function, and I put the, the symbol here. Uh, what's really interesting is that you still benefit from the uh, specification uh, features. So you, you can have a C function, it still puts uh, preconditions, post conditions on it. And to export, to use ADA function in ADA, it's just, it's just uh, more or less the same. <coughs> okay, so that's it for the, uh, let's say, very quick introduction to, uh, to ADA and Spark. Um, maybe you're wondering where this is actually used, uh, and, and the answer is here. Uh, so avionics, defense, rail, and space, uh, these are the really uh, core domain of uh, ADA and, and Spark. Um, of course, what, what is common to those domains is that failure is not an option. Uh, and what's really important to see as well is that uh, most of them, not necessarily different, but the other three, uh, you not only uh, don't have any rights to fail, but you also have to prove that your software is correct. So before you put an aircraft in the air, somebody, somebody will sign and say, okay, this, is, this aircraft is safe, and you have to prove it to uh, this, this body, this authority. Um, <clears throat> but we also have uh, new emerging domains uh, starting to use ADA. Um, the automotive industry, uh, so there's some really bad uh, horror story these years about, uh, about uh, software in the, uh, in the uh, automotive. Uh, so we have some companies um, from Japan uh, coming to us, asking us um, how they can use uh, ADA and, and Spark to uh, improve their software. Security as well, uh, so as I said, uh, mostly with Spark, you, you have some very strong proofs, like the, uh, the fact that you, you know there's no buffer overflow in your application. Uh, this is, of course, really, really interesting for, uh, for security, and so we have some nice projects going on, like uh, Muen, which is an, uh, an hypervisor in Spark. We have the uh, French um, uh, National Security Agency that also wrote a, a microkernel in Spark. These kind of things. And uh, just a quick word about the, the company I'm working with. Uh, there are some, I think, interesting points here. So we are, we are developing uh, an, an ecosystem, a software development ecosystem around Ada and Spark, so uh, compilers. What's, what's important, I think, is nice here is that uh, uh, the Ada compiler called Gnat is part of the GCC uh, tool suite. And uh, everything we do at Ada Core is open source. So we have IDs, code coverage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we do, okay, I won't say it too loud, but we do support C and C++ as well. Uh, we support dozens of platforms, and including uh, RISC-V since uh, last uh, year. Uh, we do frontline support. That's one of the value when you are doing open source software. Uh, you have to be really uh, uh, helpful to your customers. And uh, if you don't know what this is, well, uh, lucky you. <laughs> and uh, so big announcement for this week. I'm really happy about this. Uh, Adacore joined the Risk Five Foundation uh, just this week. So I'm really happy. And I was supposed to be able to do another announcement this week, but it's going to be next week. OK, I'm sorry. So follow us on, on Twitter and other stuff, we have, a, we have a big announcement around the Risk Five for next next week. Where am I? Okay. So um, now I just want to give you a quick uh, getting started uh, overview. Uh, I won't do any live demo because that's a, a recipe for failure. 
Um, these are the, <coughs> the two uh, solutions that you can use uh, right now, two hardware solutions that you can use with AIDA very easily. Uh, so as I said, the, the AIDA compiler is part of GCC, so if you know how to compile GCC, you can also uh, quite easily compile uh, GNAT and use it on any hardware you want. I'm mentioning those two because we have uh, out-of-the-box support for it, so it, it's going to be easier. Uh, so this one is the Hi5 one uh, from Sci5. You probably know it. This is uh, tiny FPGA BX. So uh, what it means, basically any FPGA. Uh, I have a blog post uh, using especially this one, and I use the um, uh, PicoSoc, I think, uh, um, um, soft uh, soft CPU on this. So quick instructions, you go to uh, our download page uh, on the community. You can download the community edition of our tools. You have the cross compiler here, and I also recommend uh, taking the uh, native one because there is the IDE uh, and the Spark uh, uh, provers as well, if you want to have a look at that. You go to uh, GitHub, we have a, a project called, um, sorry, Ada Drivers Library. Um, so the objective is clear, is to develop uh, drivers in ADA to use on microcontrollers, and in particular, we have support for the, the Hi5 one. And uh, after that, you should be able to do something like this. Yeah. Uh, videos in PDFs, that's not, that's not a good solution, really. Well, I think you get the idea. Okay. Um, so, for the last part of my talk, I want, as I said, to uh, open uh, the, the topic a little bit, uh, and I want to give... Uh, not necessarily advice because I'm, I'm not really in place to, to do that, but uh, some uh, maybe some uh, some ideas from my point of view on how the Risk Five community uh, can keep the door open for alternative languages. Um, so first, I want to say that uh, the Risk Five community is already doing very well to support uh, alternative languages, uh, mainly by by uh, contributing to open source compilers. So of course, when you support and the so I watched the, the talk this morning about LLVM, which was really interesting. As soon as you support, uh, you have support for RISC-V in GCC and LLVM, uh, you know, you're almost already already there. That's, that's really important. Uh, and because of the very early support in GCC, we were able to uh, start programming in Ada and Spark very quickly. Uh, debuggers, of course, GDB, OpenOCD, and uh, QEMU, I think, I'm particularly uh, interested in this one. Uh, it's very important to have some simulation tools uh, to be able to check uh, quickly uh, your, uh, your implementation. Um, <coughs> so some of the challenges uh, for alternative uh, language uh, maintainers, let's say. Uh, so the first one, I think, is the, the complexity of the, the uh, instruction set, set uh, extensions. And uh, actually, from, from uh, this morning's presentation, I think I should also mention the ABI. Uh, so when, uh, if you are a hardware provider, you know uh, you have this kind of CPUs, you, have, you use this kind of instruction uh, extensions. So you can make uh, one compiler for, you can make, you can make compilers for your uh, customers, and you can uh, check them. For us, potentially, you can have uh, any customers using any kind of hardware, and we have to be able to support them. So you have to be able to produce a, a, a quality uh, a compiler and, and toolchain. And so the more uh, combination of extensions, the more difficult it will get. Uh, something else that I want to mention is that uh, um, knowing what is really implemented by, uh, by the hardware is really important. Uh, so if I want to take the comparison with, uh, if some of you are familiar with the PowerPC families these days, uh, like you get the name of a microcontroller, it's impossible to know what's, what's going on inside. So 
being very clear about uh, what are the uh, uh, extension used uh, is, is, uh, is, is really important. Uh, those two are probably going to give us, uh, so deviation from the standard uh, and, and custom or propri proprietary uh, extensions. Um, so as long as you go outside the, the standard, uh, maybe you will say, okay, I have this uh, very nice feature I want to add. It's going to be great. And I do, uh, will do a special batch of, uh, of uh, GCC for it. Uh, well, you have the risk that, we, uh, that you put out of the game every alternative programming languages because we won't be able uh, to maybe use your patch if, 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 if they are not contributed. And we probably won't be able to uh, really test those features. So every time, we will see something like this uh, from our customers. It's going to be uh, uh, more difficult for us. Um, the uh, reference implementations uh, in C, so I guess we, we cannot expect um, uh, hardware vendors to provide the drivers and, and libraries in, in every uh, other languages. Um, what I would like to mention is that uh, it would be nice to uh, keep in mind the alternative languages when doing a reference implementation, maybe getting in touch with the different communities uh, to ask if they are willing to uh, participate in writing uh, uh, the, the in an implementation in, uh, in Ada, in Spark, in Rust, in uh, whatever. Um, also, what I want to mention is that uh, C is actually not <coughs> It's, it's an OK language for reference implementation, let's say, uh, because more or less it's the basis for everybody. Uh, all programming languages have some way or others to interface with, uh, with C. Uh, going uh, beyond going into the C++ territory will, will uh, on the other hand, make things um, um, quite, uh, quite complicated. <coughs> Uh, and so the last point uh, for me today, and uh, as I said, I'm, I'm going back to this. Um, the uh, SVD format was really a game changer for us uh, in terms of support of uh, ARM microcontroller. As I explained, uh, it's, it can be difficult to write uh, hardware mapping. So having a format that you can uh, basically take any microcontroller, you generate the low-level representation. Uh, it's really easy to, to start programming uh, this microcontroller. And so I think that uh, the, the RISC-V community should uh, take uh, inspiration from this. Uh, and I actually, I'm, I don't know if there is uh, already um, uh, projects going on, but uh, I would say that we are willing to participate in this kind of, uh, of uh, definition of format. Uh, so at least I think SVD is really the, 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 the minimum, and uh, probably we can go beyond. Um, so, for instance, what I have in mind is uh, uh, specifying the, the CPU uh, uh, um, uh, characteristics uh, inside this format. Uh, so uh, I was talking about, uh, for instance, the uh, instruction set uh, extensions. Um, specifying the, the memory banks, uh, that would be very useful. Also, uh, one of the big problems with uh, SVD is that it's very uh, monolithic. So. Uh, Let's say I have two microcontrollers. They use the same uh, I2C uh, controller inside. Uh, unfortunately, there will be two separate SVD files and no real way to, to know that it's actually the same I2C uh, controller. So potentially, I should be able to do write only one driver, but uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, I know that the um, I think the Rust community, uh, some people started to do some analysis of the SVD files to try to find uh, different, uh, I mean, similar patterns in the SVD file to try to identify uh, uh, common uh, controllers. But really, I, th I really think that having a, a modular representation would be uh, would be a great uh, advantage here. Uh, and since, um, <coughs> sorry. Since the, the trend uh, and, and what we maybe are going uh, to see with uh, RISC-V is the, um, the, the ability to generate uh, and to create custom um, chips, custom microcontroller. If the tool that generates this custom uh, microcontroller could also generate the uh, custom SVD, uh, that would be uh, uh, really, really, really helpful. 
Um, so that's it for my uh, presentation. I think uh, I hope that you uh, got uh, an idea of uh, what what it can mean to uh, to do something different than C and C plus uh, plus. If you want to have a look at Ada and Spark, uh, I really recommend to go to this website. Uh, it's a new interactive website, so you don't have to install anything. You just click on the on the browser, and we, you will be able to compile and run uh, examples. And uh, you can follow us over here on Twitter and join the uh, the Ada subreddit, uh, where you will see uh, news about uh, the the technology and the community over there. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any question? Maybe. Yes. Uh, we kind of. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question is that the next um, micro semi FPGAs, right, will have uh, risk five cores, and the question is, are we do we have any do we have any plans to support it? Uh, uh, the answer is yes, but I I don't know uh, really when uh, so far. Okay, yes. Sorry, runtime. Um, so the question is, how good is the runtime performance of, uh, I guess, uh, Ada and Spark compared to, to C? Um, so the answer is that uh, it depends on the features. Uh, so uh, Ada has more features than you would find in C. So if I think about uh, uh, exception propagations, uh, these kind of things. So if you use similar uh, features, we have similar performances uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, code size and uh, runtime performance. Um, some of that is thanks to the fact that we use the same backend. It's, it's GCC, so performances are really similar. Of course, uh, when you start using more advanced features, there's a runtime penalty. But that's a, that's a balance between the feature and the, and, the, and the performance that you want. Yes? Um, uh, from yeah, your examples, I got the impression that uh, your language could actually use, uh, so Ada could actually use hardware extensions, for example, for uh, boundary checks because you limit uh, the range, uh, value range of data types. Is there anything planned to, to work on a proposal in that direction together with RISC V? Because, well, we have the opportunity to change hardware definitions here. Uh, okay, so the, the question is. Uh, it looks like the uh, the specification of the Ada language can uh, can use uh, or can lead to uh, to use some hardware specific maybe implementation to to help uh, implement those those restrictions. Um, so I would say uh, the the answer is definitely yes, um, but we are not uh, we are not really in the um, uh, in this kind of ecosystem, unfortunately. So. We joined the Risk Five Foundation. Uh, this is something, so we are definitely uh, willing to, to participate into this kind of efforts, uh, but that's not really something we do right now. Um, so yes, there's there's a lot of things uh, in Ada. You have uh, you have uh, fixed point, uh, native fixed point support. You have uh, modular types, etc. etc. So there's a lot of things that could use some uh, specific uh, hardware, uh, but yeah, we we don't really do these kind of things right now. So we use as best as we can the, the what's available. Yes. Get another uh, question uh, about Ada. So, uh, is there any possibility to um, define like um, clear on read or set to clear registers? I mean, you you showed how you model the address into the variable. Yeah. But I mean, especially when it comes to microcontrollers, that you mentioned a few times, um, you sometimes have these exotic. Okay. Uh, so we'll I will try to. <laughs> Refresh the question. So the question is: uh, Is there any possibility to do uh, what do you say? Yeah, clear, set, set to clear set registers, to clear registers etc., etc. Et yeah. Uh, so no, there's no, there's not uh, really that kind of precision. Um, what we do have is the uh, possibility to specify, for instance, for a 32-bit register, the compiler will try to optimize the access and maybe sometimes do 8-bit uh, access, which is not 
al always allowed by the hardware. Yeah. So we have ways to specify to use the entire uh, register, these kind of things, but um, nothing towards the, what, what, you, what you said. Okay? That's it then. Thank you.